I'm going to come up, uh, well, maybe, um, I don't know how long this will take. We're already kind of behind. Um, do I have this on the wrong way? Okay. Today, we're in, today is uh, Tuesday, April 25th, 2006, and we are interviewing Brian Kelly, who is a veteran from the Vietnam War. We are at Orchard Park High School in Orchard Park, New York, and the interviewers are... Joelle Cranston and Jen Smith. Oh, Jen Smith, okay. Um, I'll be back in a little bit, girls. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. I didn't know what you were interested in, so I watched an old Army blouse to see if you want okay. to look at that. Okay. I have a picture they call it a DD-214. That's a separation order. It's in the military. There's an induction order. I got drafted the day President Kennedy got assassinated. Wow. November 22nd, 1963. So I came home and uh, had my draft notice in the mail, along with the news that the president had been assassinated. Oh, one day, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so that was uh, kind of a... Uh, and I brought some pictures, if you want to look through those, and there's a picture of a training school I went to. Where are you in That's me, over there. Seems so long ago. That's in 1964, I think. That was up in Michigan and Detroit. I think that picture is some Fort Dix. That's a picture in Korea. Most of these pictures are from Korea because I spent most of my time there. Uh-huh. Where else did you go besides Korea? Well, I was in, took basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey. And from there, I went up to Selfridge Air Force Base in Michigan, which is north of Detroit. And, but I spent most of my time at a place called Fort Wayne, which is in the, right in the city of Detroit. And for there, I went overseas, and I spent the rest of my military time overseas. When I came back, I got discharged. If you came back from overseas and you had less than 90 days to serve, they just discharged you. Mm -hmm. So I came back. I had 30-some uh, days left, I think, so I got discharged as soon as I came back. So I got discharged at Oakland, at the Oakland Rep Depot in Oakland, California. How long did you actually stay um, well, overseas? 13 months. Did you have a family when you left the war? No, I wasn't married. Okay. I met my head, my parents. <laughs> right. Were you 18 when you entered the war? Pardon? Jeff, were you like 18 when you entered? I could speak drafted? a little bit, I'm a little harder hearing, oh. so. Were you 18 when you were, how old were you when you were drafted? I was 23. Okay. At the time, they were drafting people like 25 and 24, and uh, President Kennedy exempted married people, so that dropped the age down one year real fast. Mm -hmm. I had a physical, I think, in the summer of 63, and they said, well, it'll be at least a year before you got drafted. Well, let me issued an executive order exempting married people from joining the service, so that moved me right up within about four months. <laughs> so. Lucky for you. Um, what kind of influence did the whole experience have on you? What kind of what? Influence? Like on just you yourself, like what kind of feelings that you have about it? Oh, I think the influence of the military had a, probably a big influence in my life. In, in, a lot of respects as far as learning discipline and learning to uh, take orders. Um, I got to travel a lot of places like Korea. I probably would have never went to Korea. Mm -hmm. I briefly was in Alaska. Uh, places like that I probably would never have gone on my own. You know, so. so it was a good travel experience? Yeah, it was, okay. it was a lot of travel experience. and uh, At that time there was a lot of World War II people still in the military, so most of the senior NCOs and Officer for all the World War II people, so you got to learn about a lot about World War II and mm -hmm. campaigns in the Pacific and Europe and that type of thing. So. Okay. So you got a lot of first-person perspective from the war from all the other mm -hmm. um, people over there. 
And that was World, uh, World War II, you said that you were in World War II? Well, most of the you know, senior NCOs at that time were World War II people, and uh, senior officers would be, okay. for the most part. Um, did, any, did you ever get wounded or hurt or anything? No, I was never in a combat situation, so I was, okay. <coughs> Vietnam was just breaking open at that time. I was kind of at the beginning of that, and the people going to Vietnam were all volunteers who went for six months, mm -hmm. and they went as advisors to the Vietnamese army, mm -hmm. and they spent six months and came back. And in uh, July of 65, I was in Korea, and President Johnson escalated the war and they sent 500,000 troops. And we expected we were all going to get sent from Korea to Nam, but that never happened. Uh, what basically all they did was stop sending replacements for us. Because okay. as usually before you rotate it, this um, This guy here, I replaced him, uh -huh. but I got, this is me, <laughs> uh, I got there like months before he was due to rotate, you know, mm -hmm. so, and that was kind of the norm initially, but then they just stopped sending people to replace, so for every four people that would rotate, we'd only get one or two replacements because they were all going to Vietnam. Yeah. So, and they never sent us to Nam, they wanted us, you know, they offered us, they wanted to stay in Korea after our time was up. Mm -hmm. Or uh, they they pressured a lot of us to go to OCS to become officers, uh, but there wasn't anything they could do to keep you at that time. Mm -hmm. So when my time was up. I just left. So. So you didn't want to become a leader or anything, or just continue? I just wanted to get out. No, I had um, I worked at the for General Motors before I went in the military, and I had a pretty decent job there. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to return and come back. You know. Right. When I went in the army, you paid 65 hours a month, so it wasn't uh, exactly <laughs> yeah. some place you wanted to spend the rest of your life, you know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think when I got out, I only made uh, 108 hours a month. So. Well, it's better than 65. <laughs> <laughs> and did you go back to General Motors yep. as soon as you got back? Shortly thereafter, I took a little vacation. <laughs> Did you guys ever have any like leisure activities that you could do or any entertainment while you were there? Well, we did. I did quite a bit of traveling in Korea, mm -hmm. and uh, I taught school. I taught English in a school for a few months, maybe six months. They, they had a lot of school. Or there were a lot of Korean students who were coming here to do graduate work. Mm -hmm and their English was left them perfect, so they had these schools and they paid GIs to teach English. And what we taught was just conversational English, not grammar or that sort of thing. Yeah. Because the Korean schools, all these people had had many years of English, but they didn't, they could talk, but they didn't know what they were, they didn't understand what they were saying. Okay. And that was the English style of teaching languages to foreigners. They taught them all the grammar and all the rules but they didn't teach him conversational English. Right. So we would, I would spend about two hours in a room with st these students and we would just talk and they would ask questions and I would try to explain uh, what words meant, you know, because there's so many double meanings in English and that kind of yeah. thing. And so we would just talk for a couple hours and they were, and the biggest problem with the school was you couldn't, when your time was up, you couldn't get away because they were so anxious to learn. Mm -hmm. They didn't want you to leave. Mm -hmm. And when you wanted to leave, then they wanted you to go to a coffee shop with them and spend two more hours talking. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they were very, very anxious to learn. And it was kind of interesting because they could, if you wrote something on a blackboard and you made a, uh, a grammatical error, they could point it out to you immediately because they knew all the, mm -hmm. the, the rules. Mm -hmm. But they did not, didn't understand what they were saying or what they were, they could read, they could read from a book. And they didn't comprehend what the uh, what was it, what they were reading at all. Yeah. So, but it was kind of interesting for a while. But it, uh, I did it for four or five months, I think. Mm -hmm. And we traveled around. I used to. I was in Pusan, and that's what they used to call the Korean Riviera, mm -hmm. that was on the southern coast. And the climate is probably like Georgia or South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Very hot summers, 
and the winters are mild. Now up in Seoul, which is the capital, is up north, and that's more about like here, you know, kind of cold winters and mm -hmm. so. And I, in my job, I used to go back and forth to Seoul quite a bit. So and then on weekends we would go on off sometimes and, and see other things in Korea. But there, uh, basically, it was kind of there was things on post you could do. There was a, a movie theater. Mm -hmm. There was um, a USO, there was a library, there were bars, PXs, and that kind of thing. Okay. We used to live in uh, Quonset huts. Those were quarters. Is this in Korea? Pardon? Is this in Korea? Yeah. Oh, okay. And the, these were divided up into rooms. You had a very small little room. Uh -huh. But we were, this is the outfit I was in. Korean military advisory group, and it was kind of an elite organization because we worked for the embassy instead of working for the army. We were part of the army, but we were actually uh, part of the embassy thing, you know. So we had to have passports to go overseas because most GIs didn't have to have. So we had a little better facilities. That doesn't look like much, but the Eighth Ar this was an Eighth Army compound we lived on. We had private rooms, mm -hmm. and Eighth Army people just had bunks row to row, you know, right, in these plots yeah. huts. Senior NCOs had regular buildings. We had a beach. We had a club out at the beach. We, could, we had a bus in the summertime. You'd go from the, the uh, compound out to the beach. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a club out there. That was our, where the beach was, mm -hmm. out there. And that's uh, a, I don't know, it's a Photograph of a bunch of Koreans. This was the guy I replaced when I left. It's an interesting person. This guy was a Filipino. He was, I think at the time he was 58 years old. He'd been in the Army for 40 years. And uh, that's all he ever did when he, he joined the Army when he was 18 and had been there all his life, you know. Wow. Uh, but he was kind of an interesting character. Mm -hmm. Imagine he isn't around anymore. Uh, we had houseboys. This is my houseboy. And they took care of all your, they cleaned your room. Kind of like a maid. <laughs> like a maid, yeah. yeah. They did, signed your shoes, mm -hmm. took care of your room, made sure everything was right, and they washed your clothes mm -hmm. and ironed them. And uh, so you didn't have to do anything. It was a lot different than being in the military in the States. Yeah. I could have never, if I'd ever had to come back and and uh, <laughs> do all that stuff myself, I probably wouldn't have made it. Right. But these guys made, you gave them three dollars a month for your personal services and four dollars a month to do your laundry. Mm -hmm. So you paid them seven dollars a month. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't sound like very much, but they worked for like six guys. So if they made forty dollars a month, they were in the, the elite in the Korean society. Yeah. The doctors only made about thirty or thirty-five dollars a month. Mm -hmm. So they were pretty affluent for <laughs> Yeah, I situation. See. <laughs> <laughs> so, and they did, you, they did everything perfect. You never had to worry about anything. You know, everything. Your clothes were always pressed per perfectly. And your shoes were always shine, and your room was always neat, and your bed was always made. And, yeah. Uh, they, um, it was <laughs> kind of a neat system, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. You could really get spoiled, you know. Uh huh. Because if you came back and you had to do all that stuff like here, you had to do all yeah, you know, like laundry and take care of your own <laughs> yeah. living quarters and that kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, as a church in Korea. This is just part of a village. Mm -hmm. uh, that's part of the village again. That was me at the beach. <laughs> Parties, we did a lot of partying, I guess. This is where, I think this was in, uh, was it? this was in Seoul, uh, in the middle of the city. That's me again. And you can see the whole country is very kind of rugged mountains and uh, yeah. a lot of uh, This is a typical what a Korean village looked like there with the towns around, you know, pretty ramshackle looking and poor. Mm -hmm. Most of them had, they would build these little houses in a circle and that's what they call a village. Maybe 10 or 12 and um, it was kind of like a, they had a community well, 
and community bathroom. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to take a shower, you had to go and pay. It would be a place you could go and pay and, and use a shower to take a shower, that kind of thing. You know, so. mm -hmm. um, and uh, these so-called houses were very extremely small. It was just really usually one room, you know, mm -hmm. and the bed might be in a, with a curtained off area or something, but it was, they weren't as big as uh, the, the Larry were sitting here, you know. Yeah. And if you drew a line from that column over that column over to here, that would, it would be that, would hardly be, barely be that big. Yeah. So, and then they <clears throat> did their cooking outside, then they had a little, they used to heat the place with these charcoal briquettes and they used to cook with that. And um, it would be a well, and uh, that was that was the way they lived. You know, so, yeah. And, you know. uh, this is in Michigan. This was a school I went to, and uh, that was a place called Fort Wayne in Detroit. And that was. I went to Michigan in the spring of '64, and I worked for a major. Who had, I was a clerk. Right? He hadn't had a clerk in ages, and he was just so thrilled to have a clerk, right? Mm -hmm. So then they sent me to the school, and he lost me for th three months. So he was all upset when I left. Yeah. So then I came back, and he was all thrilled. And I was only back a week, and I got orders to go to Korea. So. Oh. <laughs> so. Did you? Um, were you able to talk to your family a lot? Pardon? Were you able to talk to your family a lot? Uh, very rarely, because long distance phone calls are very expensive, you know. Yeah. Uh, when I were overseas, I could never talk to them. Really? Oh, the way it was send letters. Okay. And occasionally, we would when I would call, you know, when I was here, mm -hmm. but it would cost a fortune to call from, you know, from Michigan to here, from yeah, here right. to California or something. Yeah. Like that now, nowadays, I my I have two sons. One lives in California. One lives in Maryland, and we talk. You know, anytime we want, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, but in those days, it was expensive to call, you know. Mm -hmm. So I mean, <laughs> relatively expensive. So I very rarely talked to my family. We just, I used to write a letter to my mother every week, and she would get upset if I didn't write a letter. Oh, mm -hmm. really? <laughs> so I had a time. It was like Thursday at one o'clock. I used to sit down and write her a letter. So yeah, so she'd get a letter every week, you know. That was a, but that was our only communication, and and you could try to call from Korea, and mm -hmm. the only way you could do it was through. Army radio, I forget what to call them, but anyways, you had to get a relay from Korea to Japan, to someplace else, to someplace else, to California thing, and it was. I, I tried it a few times, and I was never successful in doing it. So, where did your family live when you were over there? Where did they live? The rest of your family? Uh, here, they lived here. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah okay. I'm from here originally. So, okay. Yeah. And did you stay in touch with? The, did you make good friends and stay in touch with them still? I made a lot of good friends, and after I got out, we st there was a few I stayed in touch with briefly, but not over a you know extended period of time. I haven't had any contact with any of those people in years and years and years. You know, it seems people from World War II uh, got more deeply involved with the people they were in because in, in World War II, when you went on the military, um, you got assigned to a unit, and you stayed in that for the duration. If the unit moved, you moved. Well, after that, they changed the system, and so rather than moving whole units, they just moved people around. Mm -hmm. So you didn't spend like World War II guys would spend four or five years with the same people, you know. Mm -hmm. And they still have reunions to this day. These outfits, you know, they mm -hmm. they go all over the country and mm -hmm. and have reunions. But uh, it then kind of died out after the World War II era because you didn't really spend that much time with people, you know. Right. I mean, I made a lot of good friends. Like I say, we kept in touch for a while, but you know, you kind of just drift apart. Yeah. Know, just like people you knew in sixth grade, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> Probably not friends with them now. Yeah. <laughs> so. Did you win any awards? Pardon? Did you win any awards? Any awards? Uh, this is the only one. I was Soldier of the Month for all of Korea. Oh, okay. Uh, and how did you win this one? Well, the captain I worked for said um, it was very hard to make spec four, that little bird on your sleeve, that was a specialist four rank. Uh -huh, okay. And in this organization, it was very hard to make spec four or spec five. It was real easy to make the higher grades. Mm -hmm. So the captain said, well, the only way I can get you a spec four stripe is if you become soldier of the month. 
And I said, I really don't care, you know, because yeah. I'm, whenever I get out of the Army, I don't care if I'm a PSC or a Spec 4 or a Sergeant Major. No, he said, you got to go, I'm going to send you this Soldier of the Month thing. So you had to go locally, and I went, I didn't make it. And the next month he said, well, I'm going to keep sending you until you do it. You know? <laughs> so the next month I went, and I won for our detachment. And then they sent you to Seoul, and you had to compete against all these guys from all over Korea. Mm. So I won that too. So when I came back, he gave me the orders for this promotion. You know? <laughs> so, so, so he was true to his word, you know. Yeah. So, but him and I were pretty good friends, and I used to do a lot of work on the side for him. I used to write speeches for him or help him. He used to do a lot of presentations for senior officers, and mm -hmm. he, he wouldn't have time to um, get all the stuff together. So a uh, number of occasions I uh, did some research for him and, and wrote speeches for him and helped him, you know, and critiqued his presentation. So he was, him and I were pretty good friends, even though, you know, the relationship between the officers and enlisted men is supposed to be a little distant, you know. So, yeah. But, so that was uh, pretty good. So I had, had a good uh, a good friend there. So Yeah. To, until he left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, how was the food in Korea? Pardon? The food? Well, we had the same food we had here, but in the military, the quality of the food depends a lot on where you are. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the best in Korea because they, we had a, we used to, before I got there, they had a, their own mess hall and they closed it down. And we had to eat in the Eighth Army mess hall, which the bigger the mess halls were, the poorer quality of food was. The small, if you got a small mess hall where there was only a couple hundred people ate or something, the food was usually pretty decent. Mm -hmm. But this was a big. It was. It wasn't bad. You know, it was okay. You could, I survived, anyways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, some places the food was real good. You know, mm -hmm. and, uh, if, if the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force have a lot better food than the Army, it seems. Uh, when I was in Michigan, I was at an Air Force base, and you could, they had a mess hall there, and um, you could order off the menu, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I'll have the pork chops today, and the yeah. cream corn, and the mashed potatoes, or whatever you want. And they'd ask you how you want it cooked, and all those kind of things. You know, in the Army, they just saw it on tray for you, you know. Yeah. The Navy is pretty good, too. We used to go out to, this, there was a place in Korea that had a, where the Korean Naval Academy was, and they had a <coughs> small detachment of, U.S. Navy people, and their mess hall was like a restaurant too. You could go in there and order what you wanted. You know, and they had table service. And it was kind of neat for <laughs> military. Yeah. But, but the army, the food was, you know, basic. Yeah. Much, you know, so. Did you um, keep any kind of diary or anything? No. No. Never did that. No. Okay. So I don't know what else I can tell you. Uh, probably a lot of things when I walk out the door, I say I should have told them this or that. But, uh, my, as far as military duty, that was very good duty in Korea. I mean, I had, you know, we had the speech club, and we had, uh, we didn't work too hard, and uh, mm -hmm. I had no extra duty. I mean, I didn't, didn't have to do guard duty or BCQ or anything. Oh yeah, that's good. Because I was the mail clerk, uh -huh. and they had mail seven days a week, so I had a make sure we had the mail seven days a week. So because I did that, I didn't have to do anything else. So. Sounds like a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would, like on Sundays, you had to get the mail, but it was only take, you know, you'd work for an hour, hour and a half on Sunday morning, and you would, the rest of the day you had off. And if I wanted a weekend off, the sergeant I worked for would, um, would do it for me. So uh -huh. him and I were pretty good friends too. So uh -huh. um, it was, you know, I, if I wanted to go someplace, or I had a couple of days off, I, I, he would, cover for me so and we took care of a it was just him and I in this office and we took care of the classified documents the ration cards and the mail so usually by noon we were we had everything done and one of us would take the afternoon off so that was nice so we, we didn't work too hard yeah <laughs> we're happy to be home yeah you know it's, a, it's quite a bit of an adjustment to come home because um when I went overseas, and I was in San Francisco, or I was in Oakland for three weeks waiting to go overseas because I had to wait for my passport. 
And we went to San Francisco a lot. And in a year, it changed dramatically. We came back and all the protests that started about the Vietnam War. Right. And people didn't like soldiers. And uh, so it was amazing the difference in a year. You know, it was kind of a cultural shock for us. Right. Because our only communications with the world back home was the Stars and Stripes, which was the military newspaper. And it was kind of, they didn't report that too much. It might have been an old thing with protests in San Francisco or something, but it wasn't uh, a big deal, you know. Mm -hmm. When you got back here and found out the way things really were, it was, it was a cultural shock, you know. Yeah. And it took, takes a while to adjust. It probably took a couple months, a couple, three months before I could... Get back into things, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was difficult, you know, so... Yeah. Especially now, nowadays, I'm sure like guys in Iraq, there's, they have instant communication, so we mail and stuff, and mm -hmm. they, they know what's going on, and we're, we didn't really know what <laughs> Yeah. So, so. Um, did you expect, like, your basic training to be, like, really hard, or was it kind of a shock to you? How, like... When what? Your basic, your basic training? training? Well, basic training wasn't, um, I didn't think it was bad, you know. Okay. It was, uh, you heard so many horror stories about basic training, but right. uh, I always took, someone told me there's nothing they can make you do that you can't do, you know. Yeah. So, I went and it was, and the worst part was it was during a winter I went to basic training. We spent, you know, 15, 12, 15 hours outside every Oof. day in the cold, but, um, it really wasn't bad. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of, um, there were a lot of people like myself who were draftees who were in their early 20s versus a lot of young kids who had, at that time used a lot of 17 and 18 year olds joined the military mm -hmm. to get away from home because they, they had problems at home. Yeah. And then they got in the military and they found out they had a bigger problem. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, a lot of times we were kind of like big brothers to these young, younger kids. You know, they wanted to go AWOL and they weren't going to put up with the arm anymore. And, yeah. Uh, so we strap them down to their bunk and say, you're not going to any place, you know. I mean, one day we had this kid, he was 17, he was packing his AWOL bag, he was going. I said, where are you going? Can't take it anymore, I'm getting out of here, you know. Yeah. And we almost had to sit on it, but keep him here, keep him there, you know. Yeah. But uh, it was, so you end up being kind of a big brother to a lot of these younger kids, you know, so. But it was, that was interesting. I, uh, while well, I was at Fort Dix, we had an opportunity to go to New York a lot, so. Mm -hmm. First time I'd ever been to the big city, you know. Mm -hmm. So we, um, we had a pretty good platoon sergeant, so he would let us go almost every weekend. Oh, so, we could, and you could take a bus up to uh, New York to the Port Authority. And uh, there were a lot of free things for GIs to do. You could go and get tickets for movies and sporting events and what places you could eat free at the U.S. All in the Cardinal Spellman Center and so there was all kinds of, you know, ways you could get by without spending any money. Yeah. Ten of us would rent one hotel room and, and <laughs> yeah. that, that kind of thing. So now you can get get up there on a Saturday afternoon and come back Sunday night. You know, yeah. So. And sometimes we went to Philadelphia. I've got to see a lot of things in Philadelphia that I probably wouldn't have seen. So you have to do a lot of traveling. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, being in war, does it like affect how you think about Iraq, for example, now, or like any other war? You know, my political views on Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a complete waste. It's, there's no reason for that war. Mm -hmm. And uh, let it go with that. You know, so. Okay. Were you upset at the protests when you got back? Do you think they were unnecessary? At the time, I did, but. As the thing wore on and Vietnam got big, went on and on and on, I, I began to really see the, the fertility of that war too, you know. Mm -hmm. I guess originally I probably was a hawk, and uh, and by the time the thing was over, I kind of changed my mind, you know. Mm -hmm. It was a, a political war that, um, all it ended up was 53,000 people being dead, so. Yeah. Did you feel like it took like a long time to get your service over with, or did it kind of go by fast? Or? Well, when you start out and you look ahead for two years, it looks like a long time, you know? Yeah. But it goes by pretty fast, you know? But, yeah. Uh, especially if you're moving around and you're doing different things and uh, you go overseas, that's a big thing, you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so then you just count the days till you get back, you know? Yeah. yeah. So you always had something to do usually, though, so you weren't really that bored or anything? Did what? You had a lot of things to do usually, so it would pass the time? 
Yeah, there was enough. We were we kept busy. Yeah. And we were always, and everybody would, if you asked someone how we were doing, they'd say 300 and a wake up, and the next day they'd say 299 and a wake up, you know. So everybody kept track of how many days it was till the end. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I really, I mean, as far as duty in the military, that was great duty there. It was, uh, you know, easy, and it was, and the type of the organization, it was mostly high-ranking officers and high-ranking. NCOs, so there was only, out of 300 and some people in the outfit, there was only 21 people that were low-ranking enlisted people. Mm -hmm. So we were treated very well, mm -hmm. and there wasn't any harassment, or uh, we didn't do any training, or bivouacking, or mm -hmm. playing war games, or anything like that, you know? Yeah. So it was more like a big happy, it was more like a job, you know? Yeah. People didn't treat you like, in the regular military, they tend to treat low, low-ranking enlisted people as, uh, with less than res respectfully, you know. Yeah. But in in that particular place and situation, uh, every, even you know high-ranking officers treated you well, and mm -hmm. they were you know more like friends than uh, more respectful. Yeah. You know. So it was a, as far as being in the military, it was a, the guys that were who were up in the DMZ, which is north of Seoul, where the that's the do demilitarized zone between right. North and South Korea. Those people would they'd be out in the field for 90 days in a row. Mm -hmm. They give them a three-day pass, and they back out the field for 90 days in a row. You know, yeah. that's all they did was train and uh, patrol the DMZ. So mm -hmm. uh, that was tough duty. Uh, right. You got to meet those guys in Seoul, and they would, when they get three days off, they go crazy. You know, so yeah. But, uh, so when you look at what the way they live versus the way we lived, it was <laughs> we weren't doing too bad. You right. Know? Yeah. So I can't say I ever had really ever had any. Bad time in the military. It was all every place I was was, uh, you know, pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a funny. I started telling you the story about this going to this school. Mm -hmm. This is a clerk type of school. And when I got out of basic training in the military, they sent me to. I think it was a clerk type of school. I got there and they said, "No, there's no room for you here. We're all filled up." So they sent me. I never went to school, so I just went to work. Yeah. And uh, so I worked at the Fort Dex, and I got sent up to Michigan, and I was a clerk. And then one day, the first sergeant had a fellow quota to send people to school, mm -hmm. and that's how I, he said, "I'm sending you to typing school." And I said, "I don't need to go to typing school. I know how to type." He said, "Doesn't make any difference. I got a full quota, and you're going." You know? <laughs> so that's how I ended up going to that school, and that's why the, I told you the story about the major got all upset because he, Cause he, he lost. Him, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and then he called up when I told him, and he called up the first sergeant. He said, you can't send him, he doesn't need to go to that school. He says, too late, the order's already cut and signed, he's gone, you know. So yeah. there was much they could do about it. So <laughs> <laughs> and now we got down here, and this guy was a teacher, and he said, does anybody know how to type? And blah, 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 and it was three or four of us, and he said, all right, he said, you come here every morning, sign in, and I don't care what you do, get lost for the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I spent did for three months, you know. And he'd say, well, there'll be a test or something on this particular day, and we'd go and take the test for the rest of the day. <laughs> Yeah. We wandered around Detroit and went down the, the, the water. This was place was right on the on the, on the Detroit River, and so we <laughs> was uh, vacation. Yeah. And then I used to come home. It was near the train station in Detroit, and on Fridays I could run down and grab the train and come. I'd be down here in four hours, you know. Yeah. And it used to cost six hours if you were you wanted to take the train. So I'd come home and I'd go back Sunday night then. So that was kind of a little perk there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. Did you know a lot of people who spent like their whole life being in the war, being involved with it? It's, you know, most of the people that were career military people were from the South. Uh huh. And because uh, it was so poor in the South in those days, you know, yeah. And a lot of them had no other opportunities, so they stayed in the military. Where here there was a lot of things, you know, this area was booming at the time. You could right. there were plenty of jobs. There was a lot of. Of economic activity, but in the down south, a lot of those guys stayed in the military because they all said there was nothing to go home to, you know. So, yeah, was, uh, and once you adjusted to the military, I guess it wasn't too bad a life, you know. You could you could learn to uh, learn to live with it, <laughs> right? And, and you know, and they, they they got married and they had families, and the military brings your family and sends all your possessions around the world with you wherever you go, so yeah. Uh, Nowadays, I guess more people from this area, I think, tend to stay in the military. Or, or people that did stay in this 
that were from the were mostly officers. That was you know if they were career officers. But as far as enlisted people, mm -hmm. it was kind of uncommon for people from the north to stay in the military. Okay. Well, is there anything else you want to add, or? Uh, no, not really. And you have any more questions? I don't know. You said that you don't really do reunions that kind of died out after World War II? World War yeah. Vietnam. <laughs> huh? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so we're just about wrapping it up, I think. Good, because the uh, period's going to end and I want to get a couple shots and stuff. And I want to hang up the flag. I think okay. the tape player stopped. Yeah, it did. Oh. Yeah. Did it stop after a, a bunch, after I mean, a couple months ago? A while, or? couple months ago, yeah, was it? All right, then I have to remember that. Because I think it's 30 minutes per side. Okay. So let's can we, can we hang up the flag here and uh, guys. Oh, is it okay if we use these pictures for our presentation? Sure. Uh, okay. okay. I probably might. I, I could get a photo of this. I think I can get this. Okay. Show that up like that. You guys done? Yes. Okay.